Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah! 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 Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah! He has defeated the powers of death. Hallelujah! Jesus turns our sorrow into dancing. Hallelujah! He has the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. Welcome, everybody. Welcome on this very special day to Worthing Tab. My name's Rich. I'm the pastor here. I'll be leading our time together this morning. And welcome to family and friends of our uh, friends who are being baptized this morning. We've got five people uh, coming forward for baptism today. It's so exciting. On Easter Sunday as well, we are thrilled that we are able to share this time together with you, celebrating new life today. We are going to sing, we're going to stand and we're going to raise the roof. Thine be the glory, risen conquering sun.
seats. Uh, this morning we are all in together as a family. Uh, we do have a crash just through the back doors there with everything being live streamed into the back as well. So if you do need to take the kids out at any point, little ones, um, the crash is through there and uh, that's, well, whenever you need it, right, basically. Well, this morning I wanted to talk a little bit first about what baptism is before we get going. So I've got a slide that's going to come up on the screen. And uh, we got it? We'll get there. There it is. So th- we've got three words there to describe what baptism is and three words to say what baptism involves. The guys who've been on the baptism course have thought about all of this. So baptism is a bath. Okay? So it looks like a bath. And it tells us that our sins are washed away. We've been washed clean by Jesus. Baptism is a bath. Baptism is also a burial. So when we put someone under the water, it's like we're saying, your old life is dead. It's gone. Buried. Never to return. But we do bring people back up out the water, you'll be pleased to know. And so that is... That is the birth. We're, we're saying, you know, everyone who's baptized, they, they're starting this new life. And like little Christians, they're, they're, they're learning and then they're, they're learning how to be a Christian and walk the way. So baptism is a bath, it is a burial, and it is a birth. And baptism involves witness, words, and water. So witness. Jesus, when he was baptized, he did it publicly. There were lots of people who came to see him getting baptized. And that was to benefit all those people. He did it publicly and it was a benefit to everybody who came. So that they could all see who this was and what was happening. It was a public thing. So there's a witness. There's also lots of words being said today. And at Jesus' baptism, there were words then. Jesus turned up to be baptized and John the Baptist said to him, Well, you're the the son of God. How... How do I, what, why are you here? And Jesus tells him why he's here, to fulfill all righteousness. So everyone who's being baptized today will say why they're here and how they came to be here. So there's lots of words. We're also going to ask you to say some words. If you're comfortable doing that during the baptism time, we're going to ask you to help our friends by saying, with, with God's help, we will support them. So there's going to be words said and exchanged. And of course, there's water Water is what you need to bath someone. (laughs) And also, in the Bible, water is a picture of judgment. So as we bury them, it's like we're saying that old life is now gone, washed away, judged, never to return, and its judgment is done. So water tells us all of these things, and at every birth, there is also water. So baptism is a bath, a burial, and a birth, and it involves witness, words, and water. Okay, so, uh, Simon, I'm going to invite you up. Simon's going to go first and share his story. And, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Good morning. So, yes, I'm Simon, and somebody had to go first, so I drew the short straw, I guess. So, here we go. So, I grew up in a non-Christian home, but was fortunate to go to both primary and secondary Catholic schools. This introduced me to Christ from a very young age, despite some false teaching. I dare say I would not come to Christ without that foundation. I did not take confirmation at 15, as I was uncertain of any belief in Christ. 
It was not until I was 29 that I got confirmed in Catholicism, but it still felt lukewarm. I was much like an old gas boiler on pilot light. Occasionally, when I held the ignition in position, it would flame up, but as soon as I released the hand, it would go out. This continued for many years. It was when my four-year relationship broke down that I was at my lowest. I went back to China where I lived like in Sodom and Gomorrah. This period lasted for two years. I prayed for a good woman and a baby girl. December 22nd, 2009, my first prayer was answered. Mutual friends introduced Nana to me, and in September 11th, 2000, uh, no, September 2011, oh, going to have to remember that one, especially when anniversaries come round. That's when we got married. I encouraged Nana to come to faith, albeit through Catholicism. Much for the next few years, my faith was, a little, was little and drifting. I had little desire to read the Bible and learn more. Though God, despite this, answered my second prayer on December 19th, 2016, when my darling Saskia was born. This all changed beginning 2019, when the series AD, Anno Domini, or which Saskia thought meant Ascension Day, um, this showed Acts 1 to 10. I was inspired, so I read Acts and the Saints' letters. I began to want to learn more. I attended Mass more often and thought I was progressing. Then March 2020 happened, along with lockdowns. The quick closures of established churches saying fellowship is not essential woke me up. This was when the light bulb turned on. I read the New Testament in earnest. Clearly, fellowship is paramount to Christian faith. If we were lied to about this, what else were lies? I read more of the Bible, the New Testament three times, then started the Old Testament. It was clear to me that I needed to move to a more Bible-following church. Et voila. So I sought more inspiration. I found this in Easter 2021 with the show The Chosen, which I thoroughly enjoy. It was accurate, was it? Was I trading old lies for new lies? With each episode that had scripture, I took out three Bibles and checked them against what I saw. They matched. This reading gave me some small familiarity with scripture and spurred me on to do more. I have since joined a few prayer groups over the years to explore faith more and continue to read the Bible as it is the best instructions before leaving earth. Now the old gas boiler is always blazing on full and died up, dialed up to 11. And of course, with today being Easter day, with Jesus having risen, I thought this psalm summed up this weekend perfectly. Some of you may be familiar with Psalm 139, verses 8 to 10. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So this is my testimony. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. Simon, we have heard your story of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ. So I ask you these simple questions. Do you turn to Christ? I turn to Christ. Do you repent of your sins, forsaking the world, the flesh and the devil, trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? I do. And do you seek Christian baptism this day as the sign of the reality of your faith? I do. And now, friends here, people of God, Will you welcome Simon, promising to support him in his Christian life and sharing with him what you yourselves have received, the gift of God's love revealed in Christ. With God's help, we, we will. will. Simon, I therefore baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, being buried with Christ, washed clean by the Spirit and raised again to walk in newness of life before the face of the Father. Amen. Amen. Oh, cool.
So my name is Brian, I'm 18. I've been attending this specific church since the age of nine, starting through the church service as a child all the way to fusion. The last few years I felt really like close to God through prayer more recently, reading the word of God, understanding the word of God a lot more. I come from a Christian family as you can see. Um, most of my friends also Christian as well. But I wanted to find God for myself and not through the fact that they're all Christian, my family are all Christian. And since coming to trust God as my Jesus as my Savior and knowing that He died for my sins through Him, God has forgiven me for all my sins. I know I will face trials and tribulations as a Christian, but in James 1, verses 2 3, Jesus says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you are faced trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Before I fully installed my trust in God, I felt my life fluctuating a lot, going ups and lows of downs. But since coming to trust Jesus as my saviour and knowing that he died for my sins, I found that I find myself at peace and I can rest any problems I have solely on him. Um, that's my testimony. Yeah. Brian, we have heard your story about how you came to faith in Christ, so I ask you these simple questions. Do you turn to Christ? I turn to Christ. Do you repent of your sins, forsaking the world, the flesh, and the devil, trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? I do. And do you seek Christian baptism this day as the sign of the reality of your faith? I do. People of God, will you welcome Brian, promising to support him in his Christian life and sharing with him in what you yourselves have received, the gift of God's love revealed in Christ? With, with God's, God's help, help, we will. Brian, I therefore baptise you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, being buried with Christ, washed clean by the Spirit, and raised again to walk in newness of life before the face of the Father. Amen. Amen. My name is Erica. So um, here is my brief testimony. I was raised in a devout Catholic family where we celebrate traditions and customs with affection. Despite attending church every Sunday, I didn't feel a deep connection or a yearning to know God more intimately. This prompted me to question their teachings, which I have not found in the Bible and seek a deeper understanding of Jesus. So I purchased my own Bible to delve into his teachings and understanding uh, biblical principles. In my life, I've experienced moments of achieving personal goals only to be left with a sense of emptiness. Conversely, during times when my plans were disrupted, I found profound joy and peace through my relationship with God. Through this journey, I have discovered that obedience to God brings unparalleled joy. While I acknowledge that I will continue to stumble and make mistakes, I have learned from Pastor Rich and Pastor Steve's baptism class that baptism marks the beginning of a journey, not the destination. 
What matters most is my unwavering faith in Jesus Christ, who triumphed over, over sin by sacrificing himself on the cross. My desire is to establish an enduring relationship with Christ, our Savior, who selflessly gave his life for my redemption, and because Jesus has saved me and I have submitted to him in obedience as my Lord, I am publicly confessing this through being baptized. Thank you. <laughs> Erica, we have heard your story of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ, so I ask you these simple questions. Do you turn to Christ? I turn to Christ. Do you repent of your sins, forsaking the world, the flesh, and the devil, trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? I do. And do you seek Christian baptism this day as the sign of the reality of your faith? I do. People of God, will you welcome Erica, promising to support her in her Christian life and sharing with her what you yourselves have received, the gift of God's love revealed in Christ. With, with God's, God's help, help, we will. will. Erica, I therefore baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, being buried with Christ, washed clean by the Spirit, and raised again to walk in newness of life before the face of the Father. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm James Owen, Pastor Rich is my dad. I've been coming to this church since I was five years old when we moved down to Worthing, and I'm going to be giving my testimony. For me, as someone who's grown up and been strongly surrounded by faith, having been in a loving Christian-centered household, living life as a Christian had often become somewhat like a routine to me, and I hadn't really grasped the full lengths of what our faith had meant to me. Actions such as prayer and reading my Bible had become things that I'd simply done just for the sake of doing it, without properly understanding the importance of it all. I'd obviously always been surrounded by amazing Jesus-focused people, with teaching and guidance towards the faith seemingly at my fingerprints at all t fingertips at all times. At the heart of all this, my parents with them nurturing me, guiding me and educating me more in our faith. As well as my parents, there was always the fusion team there on a Sunday evenings, with there always, an with there always being an insightful, and really helpful talk each week by one, someone from the team upstairs. As well as this, it felt like a home and a family that surrounds me in the faith and helps guide me in the right way. So I can't thank Pastor Steve, Natalie, Joey, Grant, Paul, and any others enough. As well as all the members of the Fusion group for making me feel at home with our faith. For me, when I first started to grasp the meaning of the faith and the Bible to a further extent than the stories I had known it by, was back in lockdown when I was new to Fusion and new to secondary school. The incredibly helpful and insightful teaching on Zoom meetings with the Fusion Group, as well as the boys' Bible study with Alex Schubert, had helped me grasp the meaning behind the faith and all that Jesus had done for me and everyone here. I'd always struggled with material and earthly desires, with me often prioritising my worldly feelings over my faith and what matters most. And a real turning point I felt for me that I remember vividly was in a morning church service we sung the hymn, Here I Am to Worship. And this made me reflect on all that Jesus had done for me, even to the extent of him dying for me, that I can live life eternally. And this made me realise how I wasn't following him how I should, I wasn't prior prioritising the faith enough, as Jesus had done all this for me, and he was everything, but I wasn't reflecting that on myself. And so this, for me, was a moment of recognition and reflection, that yes, Jesus is for me, yes, he died for me, and yes, he's the one I want to follow. And that's why I'm choosing to get baptised today. Thank you.
James, we have heard your story of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ. So I ask you these simple questions. Do you turn to Christ? I turn to Christ. Do you repent of your sins, forsaking the world, the flesh and the devil, trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? I do. And do you seek Christian baptism this day as the sign of the reality of your faith? I do. People of God, will you welcome James, promising to support him in his Christian life, sharing with him what you yourselves have received, the gift of God's love revealed in Christ? With God's help, we will. James, I therefore baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, being buried with Christ, washed clean by the Spirit, and raised again to walk in newness of life, before the face of the Father. Amen. Good morning. My name's Charmaine. Growing up, I was a shy little gal. My family might not agree, but I certainly was at school or around new people. I grew up in a non-Christian household, but I was encouraged to go to Sunday school, although I only went because I thought it was fun. I often worried and was fearful about the future or the unknown, especially death and being alone, these things would, these thoughts would mainly come at night. My poor mum would often get a fright in the middle of the night because I'd be sitting on her floor next to her, next to her bed, just looking at her. I wanted to be near her when these thoughts or fears came up as she gave me so much comfort. When I was five years old, my uncle Steve died in a tragic accident at the age of 33. He was the most kindest, calmest and caring person I knew. A few months after his death, I was turning six years old and the night before my birthday, I was very excited. I couldn't get to sleep quick enough. In the middle of the night, I woke up on the floor, sitting up, leaning against my bed and cradling my legs. I thought to myself, how did I end up on the floor and in this position without even waking up? It was very strange. I stood up and looked at my bed and noticed how lovely and neat my duvet cover was, and in particular, the corner. The corner of my duvet was folded over perfectly and it reminded me of my grandparents' house, always so neat and tidy. I got back into bed and laid down. I turned to my side and there in front of me, towards the end of my bed, was a shining golden man. He was gazing at me and I at him. I felt so peaceful and fell straight asleep. The morning arrived and I was thrilled because I received Beauty and the Beast roller boots for my birthday. I was very happy. I said to my mum, I saw Uncle Steve last night and he was golden. She said I was very lucky. I grew up still very worried, anxious and fearful and was in the pursuit of happiness, not completely forgetting what that ev about that evening I had, but distracted by the world and filled my time with shopping, travelling, work, partying, self-help books in the hope of finding fulfilment. During lockdown, I was 33 years old and James and I found out we were having a little baby boy and we couldn't be happier. It was a time where we got to really slow down and enjoy more time together. Archie arrived 17 days overdue and by emergency C-section, he was perfection. We came home after five days in hospital and settled into family life. 
James was brilliant and took to fatherhood so naturally. I did start to feel anxious again around this time, and it got worse once Archie was around three months old. Worry and fear felt like it was taking over. My parents kindly said that I could stay with them until things settled down, so Archie and I went to stay with them for a few weeks, and during this time we spent every day out in nature, going for walks, visiting churches, enjoying being outside. I was also given a crystal from a lady who said it would help with my fear, so I wore it on a necklace around my neck. I soon discovered that being in nature was very nurturing for me. I'd stopped watching TV and lost interest in a lot of things I had done before, and when I went back home I started gardening and also started to collect crystals and self-help or healing books. One day, Archie and I were on one of our walks and we were standing under a magnificent blossom tree in full bloom and the crystal I wore around my neck fell off and I never put it back on. I was about to start reading a new book on healing, or so I thought, when I had a strong urge to read the reviews first. I came across a review from a Christian lady warning people of its deception and that it was a copycat of the Bible. So, I got a Bible. Once I started reading the Bible, it didn't take long before I wanted to get rid of all my crystals and so-called self-help books. They all went in the bin. I knew the Bible was truth, and it convicted me in areas of my life that I knew were not right. It took me back to that evening I had as a little girl, and I just knew it was true. Things seemed to make sense. I found out Jesus died at the age of 33, the same age my uncle passed and the same age I was blessed with new life. Jesus folded his cloth when he was resurrected to signify to his disciples that he would be back and that reminded me of my neatly folded duvet cover that evening. My mum also told me that my uncle Steve wanted to gift me with a tree on my sixth birthday before he had passed and of course Jesus is the tree of life. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you won't have troubles in your life, but it does mean that you'll never be alone and death will come to us all, but we will spend eternity with our God, Jesus Christ. We do not need to fear. Charmaine, we have heard your story of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ, so I ask you these simple questions. Do you turn to Christ? I do. Do you repent of your sins, forsaking the world, the flesh and the devil, trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? I do. And do you seek Christian baptism this day as the sign of the reality of your faith? I do. People of God, will you welcome Charmaine promising to support her in her Christian life and sharing with her what you yourselves have received, the gift of God's love revealed in Christ. With, with God's, God's help, help, we will. will. Charmaine, I therefore baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, being buried with Christ, washed clean by the Spirit, and raised again to walk in newness of life before the face of the Father. Amen. Amen. Take this down. Tony's going to lead us in prayer. We can watch him walk down. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we 
we give you thanks this morning as we celebrate the, uh, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we think about this on this Easter Sunday, this resurrection day. Father, we thank you that our Lord and Saviour was raised from the dead to eternal life. Father God, we praise you and thank you that he laid down his life on the cross for each one of us, Lord. That whoever believes in him and believes in his name would be saved and not perish, but have eternal life. Father, thank you that he was able to bear our sins on the tree, on the cross. Father, thank you that he was able to win this victory over sin and death. We praise you, Lord, that he is alive now forevermore. And we praise you, Lord, that we can have life in him forevermore. Lord, we thank you for these baptisms. Father, we know that baptism does not save us, Lord, but it is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that saves us. And this baptism, Lord, is a mark of our faith. It is an obedience to your word, Lord. And we thank you for its symbolism. Father, we thank you for its meaning. Father, we thank you for the powerful testimonies that it brings out in those being baptized, Lord. We praise you, Father, for the new life that each one of our candidates has had in the Lord Jesus Christ when they first believed. Father God, we thank you uh, for Simon. Thank you for Brian. Father, we thank you for Erica, for Charmaine, and for James. And we pray for them throughout the week, Lord, that you would protect them, Father, and that you would deepen their faith and their trust in Jesus in the days and the weeks and the months to come. Father God, we thank you for all of the good works that you have prepared in advance for them to do. Father, we thank you that they've been adopted into the family of God. We praise you, Father, that they are our sisters and brothers in Christ. Heavenly Father, please forgive us our sins, our wrongdoing. Lord, we do go astray. Father, we praise you that we have one who is an advocate, that we have one who has paid for our sin. And through him and his blood, we are washed clean and we are able to be forgiven each day, Lord. Heavenly Father, help us to confess our sins, for we know that you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord God, we bring before you the needs that we know are around in the world today. Father, we look about and we see wars and we see terror and we see destruction. We see people suffering. Lord, we see people hungry. Father, we pray for situations such as in Ukraine, Lord. We ask that there will be peace, that there will be an end to war, an end to killing and dying. Father, we look at the Middle East. Father, we see all the people who are grieving the loss of loved ones, those who are hoping for the return of the kidnapped father. Lord, we pray for the hostages. Father, we pray also for those families who are bereft, Lord, whose relatives are dead, whose homes are destroyed. Father, we pray for that situation, Lord, and we ask that peace will come even to the Middle East, Lord. Father, we pray for those people in Haiti, who are looking for a strong government, who are looking for law and order. Father, we pray for the situation there today. And we can go on, Father, around the world. There is so much disruption and so much strife. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering persecution. Lord, we pray for those in North Korea. We pray for those in the Horn of Africa. Father, we pray for those in Iraq and Syria. Lord, we pray for those who are refugees. Father God, please have mercy, Lord. Please help them and strengthen them, Lord, to be witnesses, to point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father God, even in our own country, there are people who are suffering, Lord, because of uh, the financial situation they're in, Lord, finding it just hard going, keeping families together. Father, there are those who've experienced abuse, those who are addicted to alcohol and drugs. Father, there are those... Lord, who are struggling today with their mental health. Father, we pray for your help. 
Lord, we ask that you would help us to be uh, a beacon to them, that we might point to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to serve where we can, when we have opportunity, Lord, to show the love of God to others. Help us, Father God, to do that. Lord, we are leaning on you. Father, we need you. Help us to love others as you have loved us, Lord, and help us to forgive one another as you have forgiven us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and sing two songs, one after the other. First one speaking about everything that we need we have in Christ because of his death and resurrection. And the second song singing about his coming and our longing for that coming. And when he comes, when he returns, we will be resurrected and we will all declare that he is worthy to be crowned, to be king, to be worshipped. Let's stand for him.
Today's reading is from John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So we ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, 
and she wept. She stood looking into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. Thank you, Stella. John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So it's the first day of the week, early in the morning. Mary Magdalene is up and the sky is still dark and she's on the road. Her eyes are still stinging from the tears of the last few days. And they're now straining in the half-light as she carries the oils and spices as was the custom to anoint and treat the body of Jesus. And Mary must have been filled with a, a tremendous sense of fear and of unease as she comes to observe this ritual. She's worried what she's going to find. I'm sure she was mindful that in a brief moment she would have to be running her hands over the cut and ploughed back of Jesus to wash away the blood and filth from his cold flesh. And the tears start to flow again. This process of reverently and carefully honouring and washing the body was going to be tremendously difficult, highly unknown and of course very traumatic for her. And maybe you this morning can empathise to a point with Mary. She, like you, wakes up early on Sunday morning on Easter day and all she wants to do is come and observe the ritual and honour her friend, the washing. But all the while, there's this deep, unnerving feeling about what the day is going to hold. Perhaps you felt something similar this morning coming to church. Well, Mary Magdalene, she's, she's weeping. She's got a, he a heavy heart. And what does she find when she arrives? Well, she discovers the stone is gone, Firstly, the grave is open, the soldiers that were supposed to be there, stationed to guard it, had gone, and there were folded grave cloths where the body of Jesus should have been. He's gone. But where? Imagine her pain. Imagine the, the heart racing, the panic, the tears flowing, mind spinning when she sees this. So she runs and she, she goes to tell the others what she's found and they come to see as well. And, and they are shocked just as she was shocked. It seems they're all trying to find Jesus. And they all think they know where to find him. They think he should be there in the grave. And they're confused. Where has he gone? Grave robbers? Some terrible desecration by the soldiers, maybe? Where is he? They've lost him. Well, the others, having come to see, they now depart. They've lost him. They don't know where to go. So they go on their way. But Mary stayed. She stayed and she wept. Lonely, in the stillness of the morning, a calm and quiet place, a cemetery. And all you could hear was the sound of her solitary lament. Jesus is gone. Lost. Taken. 
It's a moving scene, isn't it? And, and none of us wants it to end there like that. Of course we don't. And so as we read on in John 20, we see after a while, Mary gets up, she heads over to the mouth of the tomb, she stoops to peer in, and as she stoops to see, what does she see? Yet more shock. Who are these two? Where did they come from? How did they get here? Maybe they know what's going on. The conversation that ensues, well, it seems fairly matter-of-fact. They ask her, woman, why are you weeping? Oh, they've taken away my Lord, and, and I don't know where they've laid him, she replies. The conversation was matter-of-fact. But the situation, the imagery is staggering. These angels sitting at either end of the stone where Jesus was laid, the head and the foot, it's a strong and deliberate picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you've seen Indiana Jones, you'll know what I'm talking about. It was the object that was at the heart of the worship of the ancient church there in the Old Testament. It was a golden seat with, with angels at either end, like a throne for God. That's what it was made to picture for the people, where God would sit among the people, for the people, the mercy seat. And now, in the heart of the tomb, you've got these angels sitting either side of where the Lord was laid. The symbolism and imagery that John gives us here is quite deliberate, and it's quite astonishing. So we're back with Mary. Just think what's happening. One moment she's looking into that tomb, staring into that dark place with those two angels side by side, a picture of something old, something temporary. And then, in a heartbeat, as she turns, she's, she's looking away now from the tomb, looking away from the place of death and shame. And she looks into the cemetery garden and she sees Jesus, although she doesn't know it's him yet. From the tomb and the shadowy pictures of the old, she turns and she sees the new. Here, in the risen Jesus, is the heart of the new temple, the centerpiece of worship. It is the presence of God with us. He is Emmanuel. He is imminent. He is near. He is whole. He is real. He is solid. And now he is beyond the touch of death. This is now your place of mercy. This is now God's presence with us. The risen Christ. Mary sees him. At first, supposing him to be the gardener. And, and, and why a gardener? Think, what, what does a gardener do? What would the gardener do in that place? He would till the earth. He would tear it open. And he would place the seed in the ground and then oversee its growth and new life. It really is the gardener. The gardener. Woman, why are you weeping, he says. Sir, if you know where Jesus is, tell me. Tell me the distress, the whirlwind of emotions, the, the shock, the, the grief, the fear, then those angels, and now, Mary. Mary. I'm not lost. <laughs> and you don't come to find me, daughter. Clearly, it is you who are lost. And I come to find you. I am the gardener. I have tilled the earth to its farthest depths. And now I'm here. I am alive. I am renewed. And isn't the air good this morning? Go and tell. Go and tell the others that you've seen me, that I am alive, that I have reversed the way of Adam, that death is defeated, and that I alone now hold the keys. There in that place of shame, that place of death, of lament, of fear, it's a low place. It is a hard place to be. 
the place of Mary's mourning, her weeping, her tears, her confusion, her loneliness. And there he stands in that place, victorious over death, speaking her name. All her sorrow, all her fear, all those horrible thoughts about death that she had in the morning. She can sow them here in the garden and leave them with the Lord. He's the gardener. He can take our sorrow, our fear, our loneliness, our sin, our death, and he can turn them all to joy and new life. Old lives buried, new lives begun with Jesus. Friends, why are you here this morning? Why did you come? Did you come to observe the ritual of baptism? Did you come to honor a friend and their washing? Perhaps you were worried this morning when you got up what you might find here today. What's the day going to hold? You, you feel out of place maybe, feel a bit lost. Did you come here this morning because it's the first day of the week, it's Easter Sunday, and you've come to honor a famous dead teacher, reverently, religiously even, paying your genuine respects to Jesus? Perhaps you came here this morning hoping to find something or someone, looking even for Jesus, looking for someone to help you through life, looking someone, for someone to teach you how to how to live well, how to be good, someone to guide your life, give you order, meaning, someone and something transcendent maybe, something ancient. If you came for the ritual, if you came for the religion, if you came for the reverence to give respect or to research, you've come for all kinds of good reasons this morning, but here is the real Jesus. He's alive and he's back from death and he's come to find you you who are lost he's here for you the great steward of creation who descended from the greatest height and went down to the lowest and deepest depth parting the very earth dealing all dealing with all that is dark all that is evil all that is old all that is wrong all that is is tearing you apart and he tears it all apart he takes it down. He puts it in the grave, in the place of judgment. It is gone. It is sown into the lowest place, even death itself. And he will take your life, just as we've seen with our five friends this morning, he will take your life with all your sorrow, all your sin, all your tears, all your failure, all your lostness and loneliness, all your religion. And he will wash it all away. He will bury it, dead, gone, old, past. And he will bring you new life, new birth, and new hope, and a new way. He will bring you his resurrection life. And that gives you hope for the future. That because Jesus now lives, you too will live that death has no hold on him, and if you are in him, death has no hold on you either. Whatever the reason you came to church this morning, Jesus is alive, and he's here for you, and you can call to him, but he's calling your name. He's calling your name this morning. He wants to make you his own. He longs to know you. He loves you. And he wants to take you to his Father. He wants to have that life and relationship with you. In Jesus, death is dead. Sin is no more. And life, true life, can be found. You can meet with him. The God who comes near. The God who is imminent. The God who is real and solid and full of mercy and alive. He is the heartbeat and centerpiece of all our worship and everything we do, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus, the great gardener and steward of creation, the one who 
reached to the dust to form us all in his image and likeness. Thank you that he is the image of the invisible God. Thank you that we can see in Christ life and hope. We can look to Jesus and know what God is like. Thank you for sending Jesus to us. Thank you that he came and found us. Thank you that he says our names. Thank you that he is alive. Thank you that he can give us life and hope and deal with all our sin and death. We thank you for sending Jesus and thank you that he is risen from the dead. Amen. Therefore, to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be ascribed praise and adoration, worship, power, and dominion, and all authority, now and forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, folks, for coming today. We've got hot cross buns, tea, and coffee over here and also in the foyer. And our evening praise service is at 5.45 for a 6 o'clock start. Love to see you then.